Well, good morning once again, Providence Chapel. I have really enjoyed my time with you. I was telling Lee just a few minutes ago, I said, I really like the aroma of this congregation. Every body of Christ locally has a peculiar aroma to it. Uh, some sweet, some not as sweet, but I've really been thankful for the, for the sweet baked bread that I have smelled among y'all here in Texas. And even the joy, I, I'm, I'm preaching this morning and I saw these little uh, bread wafers in the back and I said to Lee, Lord's table this morning? And I was hoping as I was preparing that you were doing the Lord's table. So the Lord meets with us providentially here at this church and I've counted it a joy to be among you. Please take your Bibles with me and turn to John 3.16. I'm not going to tell you anything new. Like Peter says, I think it meet as long as I am in this tent of a body to stir you up by way of remembrance. So John 3 and verse 16, that will be the focus of our attention. It will lead us to the Lord's table like an appetizer, I trust. So John 3, 16, let's read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Let's pray together. Our heavenly do, Father, we do pray that you would speak, O oh Lord, and that you would come. We think of how all these preparations have been made. We see that the, the kindling of the cups and the wood of the wafers have been prepared, and we ask that like on Mount Carmel, when, when fire came down, we, we pray that you would bring that fire of your presence to us. And may there be a soothing aroma that comes up from your nostrils. We need your Holy Spirit for this. So come, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. So we've been talking about encouragement adrenaline for the soul and I want you to know that we're, we're not talking about what's called that moral therapeutic deism that takes place MTD in America it's it's a religion that presents God as a genie who upon the rubbing of the lamp spirals up like a vapor in front of us with a towel on his forearm saying, you rang? What can I do for you? And the idea that somehow God is to us who brings to us his obligation of giving a happy life so we can avert depression and feel good about ourselves. That, that's not what biblical encouragement is about. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 that we are to encourage one another. And like our brother said, not puff up one another, but build up one another as we're doing. And so I get to now, as I've talked about different subsidiary elements of encouragement, now I get to bring to you the ultimate encouragement, which is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. You see, biblically speaking, the gospel of salvation in Christ alone imparts the eternal life that every soul needs to avert not just a, a temporary depression, but this is the encouragement we need to avert an eternal depression in outer darkness in hell. This is how urgent this issue is this morning because 
Only justification by faith and regeneration by God's Spirit can bring true joy and enduring peace. And any self-help treatment short of this spiritual new birth is tragically and fatally nearsighted. So let me bring to you the biblical gospel as the ultimate encouragement. And just lest you experience believer, okay, I've been a saint 35 years, 50 years you may say. Don't you dare just sit back in your seat and say, hope the guy in the seventh row who's new here today, hope it'll be good for him. I'm going right after you, brother. Just like I'm going after me. Because we all need the encouragement of the gospel. Whether it's the first time or the 10,000th and first time, we need to be spurred on and encouraged by the adrenaline of the gospel. So I want to have five main headings regarding the gospel and how it's an encouragement to us. First consider how the gospel saves for eternity. The gospel saves for eternity. Around the middle of the 19th century, Morris Rich painted a masterpiece called Checkmate. If Joel Beakey was here, you may have heard of this painting because I got it from him. And it's a painting. It was hanging in the Louvre. And in the painting, you will see a picture of a chessboard painted in. And then there are a configuration of pieces on the checkboard, chessboard. And then there are two characters. On the, on the left, there's a picture of a young man staring at the chessboard. And there's a look of horror on his face. And there's a tear running down his cheek because he has sold his soul to Satan, who's on the other side of the board. And he considers that he is lost for eternity. On the other side of the board, there is the devil who has a predatory look upon his face. And he's saying, checkmate, you're damned for eternity. Well, on the wall in the Louvre, it hung, and the story is that two men came and were staring at the painting, and after about three minutes, one of the men walked away, but one stayed because he was a chess master, and he stared at the configuration of pieces on the table, and he stared for 10 minutes and 20 minutes, and finally at about the 30-minute marker, he shouted out, wait, it, it's not checkmate. There is a move. There is a move. And what I want to say to you this morning is this. You may have come in here with a sense of guilt that's at your throat, that's suffocating you. You may have considered not that you're the sick guy in the seventh rows, a pagan, and came in here, but you're somebody who's been seemingly following Christ for years and decades, but because of some particular besetting sin, you fear you are a total counterfeit, and you have sold your soul to Satan by too many times, going back to forbidden fruit. And even now, if we could see you got forbidden fruit juice running down your cheek and if we can't see it God can see it and you consider you've been checkmated by your constant and continual sin I'm saying both to the guy in the seventh row and I'm saying to you long time Christian there is a move you're not checkmated and the move is that you can go to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning you can go to Christ this is the gospel that saves for eternity I still remember that there was a young man who came to our house in Holland, Michigan. We were putting new carpeting in, and he turned on his telephone, and there were these hymns, just like you got at your big grand piano. These hymns were playing, and my wife Diane said, the guy's name was Nate. He was a Marine who'd been in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Nate, what, what, what's with this? We had never met him before, but he says, well, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, he says, I'm, I'm going to get baptized this coming Sunday. And he spun out this story of how when he was in Afghanistan and in Iraq, in the military, he had sinned against his wife and against his children in unmentionable ways overseas. And now he was that guy in the painting. He was, he was checkmating. He, he came home from the stint in the service 
to his wife and his children, he considered the shoe would drop. He'd lose everything because God was going to judge him. But instead, he realized there was a move. He could run to Christ. And he did. And he was saved. And so that's the theme that I'm after here. That the gospel is the ultimate word of encouragement to fainting and collapsing souls. And it is this. There is a move. You can go to Christ. He can rescue you. He can save and snatch you from your death row bench that you're now sitting on. You see, the checkmated Marine Nate and any criminal hell-deserving sinner and I today can go to the cross of Christ. In fact, you can go to him right now, even before the Lord's table. I I want you to come with me to an ugly skull-shaped hill outside of Jerusalem back in 30 AD. Look there, look. There Jesus hung naked, nailed to the cross, and the Bible records him crying out at the ninth hour, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. You hear him shouting, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Matthew 27, 46. What in the world is going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. Jesus is taking the electric chair of eternal punishment in the place of sinners. He's been banished there on that hill to hellish horror of teeth gnashing outer darkness, away from the favor and the smile of his father. What's he doing there? He's undergoing God's wrath that sinners deserve. He's he's taken our hell. He's sacrificing himself as our substitute. Just, Just consider what's going on there. All the sins of his criminal friends at that moment in time were legally imputed to the Lord Jesus Christ, were were morally loaded onto the hard drive of Christ's infinite soul. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I saw you had a Getty hymn here. You ever sing Getty hymns in this place? You, you know that, that hymn, Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your bloodstained brow. He, even the stain of the forbidden fruit that you have messed around with recently stains his holy face as he's on the cross because he's he's bearing your sin. Every evil deed, every bitter thought crowning his blood-stained brow. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. Does Lee ever quote Spurgeon in this place? Spurgeon once preached regarding that cry of dereliction from Matthew 27. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here Spurgeon says this. This is the voice out of the belly of hell. It marks the lowest depth of the Savior's grief. The desertion was real. And Spurgeon continued. He says, we believe this agony was equal to the agonies of the lost in hell. And remember... Not the equivalent for the agony of one, but an equivalent for the hells of all that innumerable host of souls whose sins he bore, condensed into one black cup and drained by him in a few hours. Spurgeon goes on. The miseries of an eternity without end. Miseries caused by a God infinitely angry because of an awful rebellion. And and these miseries multiplied by the millions for whom the man Jesus stood as covenant head. Ah, Spurgeon says, what a bitter cup that was. And yet he drained that cup, drained it down to the last dregs, and not a drop was left. And praise God that not a drop was left because if even one was left... In my cup, I would weep and wail, gnashing my teeth for eternity. 
but because he so loved me. And they taunted him on that cross. And in a moment before he was finished drinking the cup, he could have leaped down from that cross and all those who wagged their their heads at him, he could have kicked their skulls into the next galaxy, which they deserved. But instead, he hung for me until it was finished. The last drop was finished. And and having drained that bitter cup, Jesus shouted, it is finished. And bowing his head, it says, he gave up his soul in John 19.30. And Spurgeon goes on. And and Spurgeon really, Spurgeon struggled with assurance. Did you know that? Sometimes we think that the true man of God never wrestles with assurance. You know, there there are times when we say like in Romans 7, "What what a wretched man am I. Who who will rescue me from this? Spurgeon was like that. He struggled with this. Listen to what he says. He's counseling his own soul that, that was previously checkmated. Listen to what he says. Guilty soul is talking to himself. For you, my soul, no flames of hell. For Christ, the Paschal Lamb, has been roasted in that fire. For you, my soul, no torments of the damned. For Christ has been condemned in your place. You see, Jesus' great work on the cross for sinners accomplished what our good works never could. Because it's a futile move for us to go to our pile of good works and think somehow they're going to benefit us. That pile is rubbish. Go to Jesus. Believe only in his finished work on the cross. Like it says in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. We have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. What am I telling you? It's just, it's the simple gospel, nothing new. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel saves for eternity. That's the first of five main points. Second one. Second one is the gospel is all you need. It's all you need. Dial back with me. Come to Michigan with me. To to Holland, Michigan, 2016. I was at the bedside of a dear Christian brother, Glenn who was a farmer. He'd been diagnosed with cancer. The hospital bed had been brought to his farmhouse. You look outside in December at the Arctic tundra in Michigan. The craggy tree limbs have lost their leaves. Everything is bleak. And there was Glenn dying of cancer. He was almost skeletal. At the time I was visiting him, he was told he probably only had a couple of weeks to live. And Rob and his wife didn't want Glenn to die alone, so people would come in platoons or different sections of time they would take to be at his bedside, Robin said, so Glenn won't die alone. And I can remember there were times when, we'd, when I'd watch Glenn at night and Glenn would be sleeping and then at 3 a.m. he'd be just rustling around. He'd wake up and I'd say, you okay, Glenn? What's the matter? And he said, ah, late at night like this, I think of facing God in judgment and these night dragons come out and I'm just uh, afraid of my sin. I tried to encourage him and he pulled out of his pajama pocket. Skeletal Glenn showed me this little crumpled piece of paper that he'd scratched out in his own hand. It says, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And Glenn said, Pastor, this is the only hope I got. And I did the best I could to encourage him to to, to cling to the gospel promises Glenn, Glenn, I would say, cling to the Lord Jesus like a drowning man out in Lake Michigan in a stormy sea, clings to a life preserver. You cling to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ will hold you fast. And then 
it was just three days later that, that Glenn died. And I know what happened to Glenn because I know what the scriptures say, that his never dying soul washed up on the beach of judgment. And I, I, I've, thought, I've, I've thought about Glenn and what happened to him when he washed up to another world. And I'm, I'm thinking he was greeted by angels who escorted him into the presence of the judge of all the earth. And I'm thinking that there Glenn stood and, and there the devil might have appeared accusing Glenn of all his recorded crimes of thought and, and word and deed. And I can hear the devil shrieking, surely this filthy sinner is mine. Pointing his finger even at Glenn, then to God and saying, he sold his soul to me. He sinned away any right to be yours. He's guilty of high crimes against your law. He's a criminal deserving forever punishment in hell. Checkmate. And that's what I'm thinking. Glenn opened his hand and showed all he's got, which was a promise. He uncrumpled the piece of paper and read it aloud boldly, confessing Jesus as his Lord and Savior who died on the cross and rose for him. It was like we had sung three days earlier, Billy Graham's hymn, just as I am, without one plea except my one plea. It's all I got. Christ has died for me. And at that moment, I'm thinking that, that Jesus strode forward, the friend of sinners, Glenn's friend. Jesus strode forward and showed his wounded hands and feet. And then in, he declared, I've already taken Glenn's sentence. I've already hung in Glenn's place. I've already been strapped in Glenn's electric chair while on the cross. I've already taken, Father, the full voltage of your rage and anger and wrath for Glenn's sins. I've already paid in full Glenn's infinite debt to justice. And then I'm thinking that Glenn got a change of clothing. And I'm thinking that the, the filthy rags of Glenn's sinful performance were exchanged for the radiant white linen of Christ's perfect obedience. And then I'm thinking, this burning stick snapped from the fire, my friend Glenn. I'm, I'm thinking that then Glenn was escorted past an annoyed Satan, past the, the stairway leading down to hell into the most excellent of banquets, celebrating the homecoming of Jesus' blood-bought friends. You say, where do you get all that stuff that you're thinking about? I get it from the Bible. The Bible draws this picture for us. Think of in, in, in Zechariah 3, there's this prophetic sketch of this drama. As we see it says there in Zechariah 3, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him saying, take away his filthy garments from him. And then he said, I removed your iniquity from you and I have clothed you with rich robes. And then they said, let them put on a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head and they put clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. See, that's all Glenn needed. That crumpled promise of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? You come here. You come here. That, that's all you need. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You don't need something profound. You need something very simple. Even a little child can understand. That Glenn can understand even with his fevered mind. So, so we see that the gospel saves for eternity. The gospel is all you need. Thirdly, consider how the gospel provides acceptance with God. 
And this is not only for the dying like Glenn, it's for the living. I got to talk to the men who, who are living and they got issues they got to deal with. But now I get to talk to the women. You're living and you got certain issues. And one of the issues you got is that you got children. When you come to Denton, Texas, you hit the jackpot when you're looking for women who got children. And so just consider how the gospel provides you ladies acceptance with God. We need to understand that this gospel encouragement, it's for the living in every conceivable circumstance. In fact, it's for women who desperately want to be super moms, but they find they, they, they just can't measure up. There's a book written called Christ in the Chaos, How the Gospel Changes Motherhood. It's written by Kim Crandall. She tells of her spiritual odyssey as a mom. She was, she was pregnant and then was immediately deluged by her Christian women friends and mentors with all kinds of books and pamphlets telling her how much to eat, how precisely to exercise, exactly how much weight to gain, how to train for labor and breastfeeding and manage diapers. And Kim writes... I was going to be a quiverful, all-natural, homeschooling, dress-wearing, bread-baking, whole foods-eating mother. But then the babies came and came and came, and that was it. She says, I couldn't be the kind of mother I wanted to be, the, the kind of woman I honestly regarded as more godly than others, so I labeled myself as a failure and spent the next several years in a terrible depression. She said, yes, it was years. And for Kim, it all came to a head one evening as she sat in, a, in the dark, rocking in a chair, reflecting how miserably she had fallen short that day, having impatiently scolded her son and then cursed aloud with an earshot of her daughter and then neglected the needs of her husband. She, she sat there in her rocking chair, convicted, guilty in her cell because her motherhood odyssey had led her to despair of herself, feeling like she'd fallen so far short. She, she, just, she just couldn't do this anymore. She, she couldn't be the God-at-all-together super mom that God deserved her to be. And, and she thought that God could never love her, but instead would just, just, just kick her away in absolute disgust. What time was it? It was time for Kim to run afresh to the cross and to be reminded of the only way that somebody can find acceptance with God. What Kim needed, as she was down for the count spiritually, she needed the shot of adrenaline of the truth of the gospel, the best of encouragements. So in, in mommy meltdown moments, ladies, Christian women don't need fundamentally to be reminded of the what would Jesus do behavior list. At those moments, you need to be reminded of the what Jesus already did, gospel bone. And, and Kim put it this way, Jesus is not only my example, Jesus is my replacement. He came to do everything I haven't done and never could do, and he did it sinlessly and perfectly. Because Jesus, he never had a meltdown moment when he was dealing with his frustrating disciples. He never lashed out at them in profanity. Even at his enemies, he never did. And even when the heads were wagging at him on the cross, he didn't sin. On the cross, Jesus wore Kim's and your humiliating dunce cap so that in your rocking chair, you can wear his impressive crown of righteousness. And wearing the apparel of Christ's righteousness, Kim, and you, Mom, Christian, you sit accepted in the lap of her heavenly Father, in whose eyes Kim is adored as, as the perfectly obedient son. Remember when Jesus came up? 
Jesus came up out of the River Jordan. The Father sees him. What does he say? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And, and, and Jesus was there standing with the transgressors coming up. You, you come up out of the waters of baptism, mom. And what does Jesus see in you? This is my beloved daughter. It, I'm, I'm a grandpa now. Ten grandkids. And when, they, when, they're, when they're 18 months old and they come up out of the bathtub with some bubbles still, and then you take them and you, you wrap them up in the beefy towel, what are they? They're adorable, aren't they? They're so adorable. You want to just hug them and you want to just kiss them because you're so delighted in them. Well, you realize that's the way you are wrapped up in the, in the beefy, white righteousness of Christ. Like the little boys in the beefy towel out of the tub, you're, you're wrapped up in the gleaming towel of Christ's righteousness, and you are adorable to him. Me? What a wretched man am I? Ah, but it says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It, it's like uh, you feel like you are a terrible, sinful, filthy woman as you rock in your chair of conviction, but you are dressed in those white robes of righteousness, like it says there in Isaiah 61, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in the Lord, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, you are decked. In, in, in the bride beauty that I saw in 1982 when my Diane came down that aisle, what the delight of my eyes. That's what you are now in Christ Jesus, Christian mother. Remember when, what was it, uh, Charles, remember the great wedding of Charles and Diana? All the fanfare. You're too young for that, huh? Okay, next generation. What was it? William and Kate, okay? Whoa, the fanfare of seeing. That's you! That's you with the long train of the white gown. And, and when I talk about this, I'm not, you know, sometimes girls play pretend, don't they? And they dress up in somebody else's clothing, mom's clothing, or big sister's clothing. When I speak about the the, the beefy towel of Christ's righteousness or the, the, the wedding gowns of white linen. Those are your clothes, sinful woman, not somebody else's. Those are yours in Christ Jesus. And you say, could it be that th though we deserve God's repulsed disgust, in Christ instead we get God's well-pleased affirmation, that we get God's enthusiastic commendation, that we get his delighted praise, even his, even his hearty applause. There's a striking passage in Romans 2 where it speaks of, for we are not Jews in the sense of outward circumcision. He said, because the Jew, what does the word Jew mean? It means praised of God. One whom God praises, like Zephaniah 3, it speaks of God sings over his people. He sings over them. Like, like, like I, would, I would sing over my wife on my honeymoon night. I'm, I'm so thankful and thankful. God sings over hell-deserving sinners who have been washed in Christ's righteousness. He really delights in us. He even applauds us. That's what that word means, the praise of God. There's a man who, who, who writes about this. He speaks about how we now, we who crave, we're, we're born in the image of God. And being in the image of God, there's that sense in which we, we crave the endorsement of being pleasing to other people. We're, 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 we're people pleasers, aren't we? But we're, we're foolish when we look into the grasshoppers of the earth, the one person in the world that, that we, we need to have their pleasure and their smile and their applause. It's the God of heaven. But that's what we get in the gospel. Listen to this account here. He says this. All your life you've been knocking on a door. 
affirm me, love me, telling me I'm okay. And you've been working all your relationships so that somehow you can steal self-acceptance from other people. But it never works. But in the gospel, the door at which you've been knocking will open at last. And now, finally in the gospel, the only pair of eyes in the universe whose opinion counts looks at you and sees an absolute beauty. Finally, the door at which you've been knocking all your life has opened at last. And now, the natural world of these grasshoppers, these men and women in your life, now the natural world ceases to have any claim on you. Who cares what they think now? Now criticism doesn't kill you because the only two eyes in the universe, the eyes of the Heavenly Father, they look on me with absolute delight. Because if God before us, who can be against us? Now their frowns don't cripple us and crush us. See, the gospel is the ultimate word of affirming encouragement to our knocking and trembling and aching insecure souls. And it's this perfect love that casts out all fear. So, the gospel saves for eternity. The gospel is all you need. The gospel provides acceptance with God. Fourthly, consider how the gospel is a cure-all for every spiritual ailment. Think about that. The gospel is a cure-all for every spiritual ailment. In Greek mythology, there's a goddess whose name is Panacea. You ever hear of a panacea? It's like you say, oh, in this bottle, in this bottle is a panacea, which means a cure-all. There really isn't such a thing. But Panacea was the goddess of the universal remedy. And she actually is mentioned at the opening of the earliest version of the Hippocratic Oath that's taken by physicians. Now, legend has it that she possessed this, this, this bottle, Panacea did, in Greek mythology. In the bottle, if there was a, a, a soldier who'd been wounded, or a child who'd been fevered, or a king who'd been diseased, you could take Panacea's bottle and, and pour the remedy on that, or on that, or on that, and always bought a cure in health. You know, profoundly, that's exactly what the gospel is. It is a panacea cure-all for every woe. What's your problem here? You're coming, you're sitting in a brown chair here. Again, like I said, I'm in Denton, Texas. I have no clue what's going on here, but the Lord knows. There, there are some who are, who are wounded here and who are suffocating here and are diseased here and are scarred here. I'm just telling you, pour the gospel on that and that and that and that. John Stott has written, all progress in the Christian life depends upon the, the recapitulation, the remembering of the original terms of one's acceptance with God. And so we see everywhere on the battlefield of the Christian life, we're, we're facing issues and scarrings and feverings that come from disappointment and anger and bitterness and resentment and hopelessness and temptation and fear and selfishness and weakness. And all of these issues in our lives require us to deliberately revisit and remind ourselves of the gospel, pour the gospel on that and that and that. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul, late in his life, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he writes to Timothy, things were bleak in Paul's life at this time. He's imprisoned. There's heresy abounding in the churches. Everybody abandoned him. His head is about to be hatcheted off and fall into a basket. And Timothy is protege is suffocating with hopelessness. And he gives him the bottle of panacea. And he says to Timothy, Timothy, remember Jesus Christ, seed of David, risen from the dead, according to my gospel. Well, what did he mean by that? Why do you, why, why do you tell Timothy, 
take this bottle, Jesus Christ, seed of David, risen from the dead, <laughs> according to my gospel. He gave him that bottle because he knew all the problems that Timothy was going to have. In that little bottle of the gospel is all that he needed. Because think of, think of Mary in the garden near the tomb. Everything was bleak. She couldn't see clearly through her tears. She thought it was the gardener. Tell me, tell me, where have you laid his body? And the tables were turned with, with but a word, Mary, he said to her in the way nobody else could say to her. And everything changed. The, the, the tables were turned. The world for Mary and for all of history were turned upside down by the resurrection of the dead. And, and, and that's the reality of the gospel. The gospel is we're going to die. We're going to breathe our last, our head because of persecution. Even in America may fall into a basket. But, but be of good cheer because Jesus rose from the dead. And so I, what's, I was at a church once where one of their pastors had died from COVID. And then three weeks later, the, the next pastor had died from cancer. And they were down for the count. And I could bring this to them. This is a church that was basically a dead church. And to remind them that God can raise the dead. So this is the gospel. It's a simple gospel. On that, on, that, on that first Lord's Day, he turned the tables. And so, Christian, in our darkest hours, we can take heart for the Lord Jesus is able to resurrect your joy in an instant out of the tomb. Jesus isn't dead. He's risen. He's ascended. He has gathered into his sovereign hands the reins of the universe. And he is Lord of all. And for you, he is pulling on those reins to cause all things to work. I know it's dark and you can't even surmise and imagine how all this could be working for good. But he's risen. He's reigning. He's pulling those reins for your good. And so, as Warfield has written about this, if our hearts should fail us, when the gates of wickedness stand against us and surround us, that encourage ourselves and one another with this great reminder. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, seed of David, according to my gospel. That's the gospel. Weeping may endure for a night, sister. Or brother, I don't know if some, somebody, you, maybe you were engaged to somebody and this week she ended it all. And you are devastated. My wife did that to me once, Lisa. <laughs> but weeping endured for a night, but a shout of joy came. In, in this case, I got my Diane. God gave her back to me. But somebody else may get somebody, someone else the Lord gave. And ultimately, we have the ultimate spouse for our souls, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so, so to the gospel, the gospel is the cure-all for every malady, for every one. I, I, for instance... I talked to the ladies about rocking in a chair of despair. Let me talk to the men. Men, I know a man who participated in sexual perversion in his youth, and he's haunted with feelings of indelible moral filthiness. And I know of another man who, who cheated on his wife, and though she forgave him, he still plagued with paralyzing guilt. And I know of still another man who's visited internet, cyberspace, unclean places where he's looked at women committing adultery in his heart. Listen, I also know of another man who, who recklessly miscalculated while driving his truck, 18-wheeler, and crashed into a motorist, resulting in the manslaughter death of somebody else's precious son. And he carries that around. And I know a man who, due to his own folly, committed a serious business blunder, causing the bankruptcy of his business and the collapsing of his large family's un very comfortable standard of living. And all these men battle with bouts of strangling dejection. And I say to all those guys, pour the gospel into that and that and that and that. Because on the cross, Jesus has taken these matters into his hands. In all of our sins, like it says in Colossians 2, have been nailed to the cross. 
having wiped out the handwriting of the requirement that was against us, which is contrary to us, he has taken out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, Colossians 2, 14. Because, gentlemen, every man, I think, carries around some wound or baggage, things we've done, mistakes we've committed, sins we've acted on. And even if we've repented of these things, we just don't, don't feel like we can escape from them. But the gospel comes in and it says that what we've done doesn't define us. What, what God says we are in Christ, that's what we are. This is the rich truth of justification that gives us freedom from the past. What's your past, man? Pour the gospel into that. I, I've sat in coffee shops. Huh, I think of a young man. This, this is a particular setting sin that I got, Pastor Mark. And I'm, I, I'm plagued with it. How could a Christian ever keep battling with this particular sin? I'm, I'm hopeless. But you go to the scriptures, Romans 7. Okay, look what it says here. Paul says, he's a Christian man. He's writing in the present tense. When I would do good, evil is right there with me. So I, I don't do the good that I would do. But the evil I wouldn't do, that I do. What a wretched man. He sounds just like you, brother, as you're sipping your coffee. What a wretched man. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no condemnation for those who were in Christ Jesus. Brother, 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 if the Spirit of God dwells in you, you'll, be, you'll fight. You'll fight a good fight of faith. Are you fighting, brother? I, I say this to you. Are you fighting? Back up in Grand Rapids. Call it Grand Rapids. There's a rushing river. And there's a dam and, and the coho salmon come up and they try to, try to jump over the dam to get back to their spawning grounds. And these guys, these coho salmon are very determined because they're alive. They're not sticks, just dead sticks drifting with the current. They're alive. They're fighting against the spirit. It says in Proverbs, the righteous man falls seven times. He rises up again and the coho does it. One, two, three, four, seven misses. But on the eighth time, he makes it over and gets back to the spawning ground. That's you, brother. That's you. you. You fight. You fight against your sin with all of your might and keep getting up in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of the Lord Jesus. No temptation has seized you but that which is common to man. Don't listen to the devil who says, checkmate. Believe in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead according to the gospel. You see, we never grow, outgrow the gospel. It's the cure-all panacea to our dying day. And Glenn's dying day, just to go back to Glenn, that old farmhouse, there Glenn was. We, we'd watch at night. We'd watch Glenn's chest as he'd be sleeping. When's he gonna die? She has to go up and down and up and down and up. We thought he died and gone home. But finally, that Saturday morning, I was with Robin, and his chest went up and down and up and down and up and down and never went up again. And w w where did Glenn go? Did, when, when, Glenn, when, when Glenn died, and as it were, his spirit went out to the front porch, and he, he leaped off the front porch and he free fell into eternity. What, what happened to Glenn? Did he fall under the suffocation of annihilation? Did he split hell wide open? No, no, no. Underneath were everlasting arms. Jesus has said, let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house there are many rooms. We're not so, I'd have, I'd have told you. And even Glenn, I had, said, I had read from Malachi 4 to Glenn how it speaks of, and, and when the day dawns, they shall go out as, as calves released from the stall. And Glenn was a dairy farmer. I said, what does it mean, Glenn? Calf released from the stall. I said, oh, man, those, those calves, they're in the winter. Oh, they're in the stall all winter. But some of you, you open up the door. And they run like crazy, he said, out into those meadows. I said, Glenn, that's you. You're, you're, you're pent up in this skeletal body, in this, this hospital bed in your living room. But soon you're going to breathe your last. You're going to be like a calf released from a stall. And you run out in the meadows of the new heavens and the new earth. And that, those are the prospects that 
we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just saying to you, you, tell it to the person sitting next to you. Tell it to the person at the workplace. Tell it to your sons. Tell it to your daughters. And really fundamentally, before you come to the table, tell it to yourself. That is not checkmate. Because the last point is the, the, the gospel is for you. And I'm just saying to you, it's not checkmate. Right now you can go to the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I don't care if it's the, the first time, like I said, or the 10,000th and first time. Go to the Lord Jesus. You know, I sometimes struggle with my sense of assurance. I really do. Sometimes I feel like Bartimaeus. You know, Bartimaeus... Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I can pray. And like outside of Jericho, these voices said, shut up, old man. Don't bother the teacher. I feel like I'm that kind of a barking dog, and Jesus will never hear my request. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But the story of Bartimaeus says that, that Bartimaeus didn't beg off when all those voices, I have these voices of inferiority and my sins shout me down and say, shut up, Mark, Jesus will never listen to a barking dog like you who has gone back to your vomit of sin so many times. I just resolve, I'm going to be like Bartimaeus. And it says of him, he shouted out all the more. All those voices of inhibition were like kerosene to his fire. And I've resolved, if I go to hell then I'm going to hell with a case of laryngitis because all my days I'm going to keep shouting out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So as you're sitting here chewing on the bread and drinking the fruit of the vine, just keep praying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Let's, let's go to the table with a hunger and a thirst to feast on Jesus.